Good evening, everyone. How are you? So I am a little disoriented because I have been told that I don't have a gavel to pound. Um, I've been told that that's going to be put in post-production, and so uh, I thought uh, we will just proceed. And I just wanted to thank all of you for uh, coming here. What well, has been a, probably a very crowded and busy evening to, to be here with us with uh, Ambassador Wendy Sherman. So as you know, the drill is this is going to be broadcast, and so there's a certain formality apparently that I'm required to ex exude. So please uh, forgive when I suddenly change a little bit as we start uh, going over this particular program. Um, and uh, let's see, where is Nick? I think we're ready to go. Is that all right? Okay. All right. So good evening. And welcome, everybody, to tonight's program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Philip Young. I'm the executive director of the Plowshares Fund, and I am most privileged to be your moderator for tonight's very special program. Joining us this evening is Ambassador Wendy Sherman. She's a former U.S. Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs and the author of this new book, Not for the Faint of Heart, Lessons in Courage, Power, and Persistence. Throughout uh, her extraordinary career, Ambassador Sherman has served as a role model, not only for women, but also for men. And she has highlights as being America's first female Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs. That's a big deal, folks, okay? <laughs> and, yes. Uh, she was the U and the lead U.S. negotiator for the Iran nuclear agreement. She was also advisor advisor to President Bill Clinton as the U.S. coordinator on North Korea policy. In her book, Not for the Faint of Heart, Wendy dives into her past. She talks about the lessons learned and how her experience helped her negotiate one of history's biggest nuclear agreements, and we'll be talking about that this evening. We're excited to have her here tonight and for her to answer our questions. Uh, personally, I have to say, and as a bit of disclosure, um, I'm particularly pleased to have Wendy here uh, because I used to work for her uh, a long time ago. And I have to say that I'm really lucky uh, to be able to call her a colleague, call her a friend, and an amazing mentor. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Wendy Sherman to the Commonwealth Club. Thank you. So it's so good to see you. Great to see you, Phil. Um, first, congratulations on the book. Thank you. Okay, I'm showing it one more time <laughs> here, okay? Um, and it's, it's the book that I want to start off as the jumping off point because um, it covers so much. And I thought that for us here, for our audience to start writing questions, they can hear a sort of a, um, a sprinkling of the different topics and maybe that'll spur questions for them to move forward. You talk about Iran, you talk about North Korea, you talk about the nature of power, um, high-stakes negotiations, challenges of being a woman in a field dominated by men. Um, but I wanted to start with, a, with the big picture. You open your book <laughs> with what I think is an incredible story that has to do with the last second struggles of getting the 2015 Iran nuclear deal done. Just really quick set scene setting and you can add more embellishments as you want. You're having dinner with Iran's lead negotiator. Tensions are incredibly high, and as you've said, you've blown through so many deadlines, and the pressure is enormous. So tell us that story, and I want you to tell us the central insight that came to you as a result of that. Thank you. It's terrific to be here at the Commonwealth Club. I was with the Commonwealth Club uh, before the building was done, at an MSNBC event, and I told George that I was working on a book, and he said, well, let me know when it's done. I want you to come back, and I'm really, really grateful to all of you. This is, the Commonwealth Club is an institution. You should just know, someone has turned their phone off. Um, you should just know that anybody who writes a book, anybody who wants to speak about the issues of the day is on the phone asking if they can come to the Commonwealth Club. It is really an institution that is fantastic and very helpful in the discussion of the issues in front of all of us today. So, to the book and to this story. The story is meant to really explain that when we are our authentic selves, we are our most powerful. That's really the meaning of the story. But the story is something like this. It was actually after dinner. 
After dinner, okay. Uh, because um, we didn't have meals in the same dining room with the Iranians because our dining room had alcohol in it. Uh, and uh, the Europeans thought that was really important. Uh, and uh, we had wine. Uh, but as we went on, we got invited into the Iranians' dining room, which had, quite frankly, much better food. Um, chicken with crushed pistachios, fantastic. Um, but be that as it may, it was after dinner, and we were on day 25 of what ended up being 27-day marathon at the Palais Coburg in Vienna. I ate exactly one meal outside of the hotel that entire 27 days. And it was day 25. We had one last substantive piece of the negotiation, and that was to the negotiate the UN Security Council resolution. It wasn't literally part of the deal, but because the deal was going to change previous resolutions, the Security Council resolution had to get rewritten, and the United States had always held the pen on that negotiation. So it was just me, Rob Malley, my phenomenal deputy, Abbas Arachi, and Majid Ravanchi, who were my counterparts, negotiating this. And we'd been wrangling about the substance of this resolution for months. And now we were down to it. And I had ripped a piece of paper out of a notebook, put in a couple of different formulas, down on a piece of paper that I thought might work. Remember, we'd blown through tons of deadlines. I was supposed to go to Harvard as a fellow in September. That wasn't going to happen um, anymore. So um, Abbas leaned forward. He was the lead for them and said, OK, I think this one will work. And I just thought, this is fantastic. I can tell. John Kerry, I can tell the President of the United States, we're, we're about there. And then Arachi, as he always did, as the Iranians always did, leaned forward and said, but one more thing. <laughs> and I lost it. I just lost it. I started yelling. And I was so furious. And somewhere when I was young, I was taught women can't get angry. But it is OK to cry. So I was yelling, and tears were streaming down my face. <laughs> this is not a tactic I would encourage anyone to learn to employ in a negotiation. Rob, poor Rob, had no idea what he was supposed to do with me now. And Abbas and Majid, who thought they learned their way around me after months of negotiations, were dumbfounded. There was a long moment of silence, and Abbas said, OK, we're done. <laughs> and what it really gave me insight is that what I said at the beginning, we are most powerful when we are our authentic selves. When we try to be other than who we are, we diminish our power and our authority, and it is a central theme in the book because we all bring to the table so much the power of our roles, the power of who we are, the power of our experience. Power is, as I discuss later in the book, a good thing. It's not an icky thing. It's just a bad thing when it's used for bad purposes in bad ways. Uh, but it actually is necessary to achieve justice and good things. Okay. So let's use that story about Iran and segue into, I think, what people here are really uh, very interested to learn about. We'll cover other topics as well. Um, and let's talk a little bit about Iran um, and the Iran nuclear deal, uh, which was uh, implemented and went into effect in 2015. The foreign policy establishment and the arms control community, uh, for which I'm a part of, has hailed the Iran nuclear agreement as the most comprehensive non-proliferation agreement ever negotiated, uh, negotiated in a generation. I think it would be really helpful for us, um, because of sort of current circumstances, first for you to remind us what it does, okay, and what it does not do. And I also want you to give a sense to folks here, because I have a sense having done, been with you doing these kinds of things, what it takes to do something at the scale that this agreement is at. Sure. And uh, I want you to know he's a great negotiator, too. <laughs> um, let me start at the end of that, because I think it's really important to understand. A lot of people know that President Obama wanted to negotiate with Iran to try to achieve a more secure world. People know that John Kerry 
and Secretary Ernie Moniz, who was indispensable in the last months of this negotiation, were crucial to getting this done. A lot of people even know I had something to do with it. But it literally took hundreds of people in the U.S. government to achieve this, hundreds. And as much as what happened in the negotiating room was crucial, and I had a core team of about 15 people from all over our government, there were people all over our government who worked on this, and it wasn't just what happened in the negotiating room. We had to make sure that our military was arrayed in such a way to say to the Iranians, we were serious. And if we had to take military action because nothing else worked, we would. The president commissioned and deployed a new weapon that could penetrate an underground, previously secret facility called Fordo in Iran. We had to use our sanctions to try to get Iran to the negotiating table. When the Europeans began negotiating with Iran in around 2006, Iran had 164 centrifuges. Those are the things that have to spin to create enriched uranium, the fissile material that can be used to make a nuclear weapon. By the time we had put on our extraordinary sanctions, and the world had put on sanctions, and we had sent teams all over the world, not only to enforce those sanctions, but to get oil producers to produce more oil and help countries negotiate new contracts for oil, they had 19,000 centrifuges. Sanctions do not end bad behavior. They are meant to focus the mind of the person across the table and say, do you really want this to go on? Do you really want your economy totally destroyed? Wouldn't you do better to come to the negotiating table? And those sanctions did achieve that. We had our labs, our nuclear labs, particularly in the last weeks, had their best teams available to us 24-7 because we were seven hours ahead in Frankfurt. And so we needed, when we had to do a very critical calculation, to be able to have the best consider those calculations. I negotiated with inside the administration. I negotiated with each member of the permanent members of the Security Council, Great Britain, France, um, um, China, Russia, the United States, plus Germany, plus the European Union, my negotiating partners, bilaterally and as a group. I negotiated with the Israelis before and after every session. I negotiated with the Gulf Arab states before and after every session. I negotiated with the U.S. Congress, and we provided over 200 secure briefings during this period with the U.S. Congress. And oh, yes, occasionally I negotiated with Iran. And I did all of this at the same time as did many of my colleagues while I was responsible for every other region of the world and visited 54 other countries, many of them several times, because we were also dealing with Syria, Middle East peace, uh, what was happening in the European Union, what was happening in Latin America, Cuba, name it. So it, it's an extraordinary undertaking to get here, and it took years to get here. And of course, we also had a secret channel that the president agreed to, led by the diplomat of all diplomats, Bill Burns, and Jake Sullivan. So it, it takes, takes more, more than a village <laughs> to do this. And, and that was true of every other member of the team, and the Iranians as well. But what the deal was meant to do was to ensure that Iran would never get a nuclear weapon. And we had decided that is what the president decided, that is what we should focus on. Because if Iran ever got a nuclear weapon, they could then deter our and our allies and partners' efforts in the region. It would be a deterrent against our actions. It couldn't solve every other problem. And if we had tried to solve every other problem in one negotiation, we would have been negotiating against ourselves because the Iranians would say, OK, maybe we'll have fewer rockets aimed at Israel, but then we want more centrifuges. And we would have ended up with a mediocre middle on all of the issues, as opposed to tackling this one issue, leaving all the sanctions on the malign behavior, the state sponsorship of her terrorism, their horrible human rights record, keeping all those sanctions on and building a strategy to deal with those, not having to worry about Iran getting nuclear weapons. And the deal did achieve that. The president required that we close down every pathway to fissile material for a nuclear weapon. So enriched uranium, weapons-grade plutonium, and a covert supply chain. We did all of that. There is no doubt that for at least 
15 years, if not 20 or 25, because there were verification and monitoring pieces in place that go on ad infinitum, we would keep Iran from never having a nuclear weapon. It's also true that probably after so many years of compliance, and Iran has completely complied with the deal, um, we would look for a follow-on agreement of some sort to ensure that things would continue in the same way they had for the immediate term of the deal. Um, we really think we achieved that. Even the technical professionals in Israel thought we had achieved that, that at least for a decade for Israel they were safer. But the Prime Minister, and, and I appreciate and respect his decision and his mm -hmm. choices, yeah. thought for political reasons it was not in, in, in Israel's security interest, and there were other people who felt the same way. So one of the things that I found you know, just incredible um, were reports that in order to make sure that the agreement and what you, you know, what you delineated, what they could and could not do, you had to make sure that there was nothing about physically about their reactors that would allow them to somehow divert in a way. And so is it true that there were the, the folks, the labs here actually constructed? They created models. Models. So that we would know what was possible, what was doable. Um, they put an enormous amount of resources towards this, so we knew that what we were doing uh, would really work. No, and the awesome. monitoring and verification measures that the International Atomic Energy Agency put in place are utterly unprecedented. Right, yes. Uh, so, Donald Trump has pulled out of the deal. Mm. Uh, I noticed that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Uh, we are in breach. Yes. Uh, some news is going to happen probably this next month, I believe it yes, is. Yes, beginning of November. About sanctions. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. How has the international community reacted, and how are you doing about all this? <laughs> uh, people ask me all the time, wasn't this hard when he pulled out of the deal? And I said, sure. I was happened to be in Valletta, Malta. <laughs> on the day he pulled out. Uh, I was walking the cobblestone streets and uh, my cell phone rang and it was John Kerry. Uh, he called, I think, so we could commiserate together and also urge each other on to keep up the fight. Uh, it wasn't a surprise to any of us. The president had said when he ran it was the worst deal ever, next to NAFTA, which was the worst deal ever. Um, uh, NATO was the worst deal ever, so, but we were the worst deal ever. So it wasn't a surprise that he was going to ultimately pull out, and I think Secretary Tillerson, with whom I did not agree on a lot of things, and uh, General McMaster as National Security Advisor got him to stick with it a little bit longer, uh, but when they left, that, the, it was up, the game was up. And, but the greatest sadness in it is for our country. I don't think we are safer as a result of it. I don't see any strategy for taking on Iran's behavior in the region, and I certainly think the recent events um, on the murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi and the relations with Saudi Arabia will make all of this even more difficult. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't see a strategy. The Europeans are trying very hard to hold the deal together uh, because as the International Atomic Energy, Energy Agency has now said I think 12 times, Iran is in complete compliance with the deal, uh, so they see no reason to pull out. Most large companies have left. Uh, the U.S. doesn't have large companies because we have a primary embargo, but Allianz, Total, Renault, Peugeot, Siemens, they've all left because they anticipated what will happen at the beginning of November. The oil embargo will be on in full, and most importantly, what are called secondary economic sanctions. That means any company that does business with the central bank of Iran can't do business with U.S. banks. And big companies want to do business with U.S. banks and really can't do business without doing business with U.S. banks because we are the reserve currency of the world. So the dollar is. So what the Europeans have tried to do is set up a special purpose vehicle that would help get around those dollar-denominated deals and help small and medium enterprise stay in. The Iranians, uh, who I do see when they are in New York, uh, in spite of Secretary Pompeo, Pompeo saying Secretary Kerry, Secretary Moniz and I are somehow traitors for talking to the Iranians, we basically say, please comply. Please let Americans who are kept in Evan prison come home. 
please find Bob Livingston and please stop what you're doing in the Middle East, which I think is pretty patriotic. Um, at any rate, I think the Iranians are trying to stay in the deal, though their politics are pretty tough at the moment. Uh, they're hard hardliners. Uh, really are pressing uh, for Iran to get out of the deal. They didn't want the deal in the first place because the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps had control of the black market. They'd like to have control of the black market again. So um, I think it will be a tough time, and I think Iran will watch our politics. If they think Donald Trump's going to be here for six more years, they're probably going to have to get to the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. uh, if they can hold out, if they think it'll be a couple of years, maybe they'll try to hold out. So along those lines, we're going to try something here. People have given me questions, and I th the, the one question has to do with um, what would be the most effective way to prevent Iran from evolving itself in terrorism? And then the, the other question has to do with what Iran is using with the, what its money, what they call the peace dividend. And I also think it relates to the question that I think would help be helpful for all of us, so you can choose how you want to answer this, as to why is Iran doing what it's doing? Um, what are their aspirations? And, um, you know, you, ba you basically became an expert on Iran. So tell us your analysis on this. I'm only a quasi-expert on Iran. Uh, from being with them, I had people on my team who really were Iran experts, uh, including uh, our intelligence community and people who had studied and worked and lived in Iran. I've never been to Iran. Uh, John Kerry's never been to Iran. Uh, Ernie Moniz has never been to Iran. Uh, and uh, obviously Barack Obama has not been to Iran. Uh, there was a point when I, I couldn't go when I was a high government official. Uh, in between the times I was in government, I had a plan to go visit Iran, uh, but my mother passed away and that trip went out the window. And I, I, it's quite frankly probably wouldn't be safe for me to go now. Yeah. Even, if, even if the president's office said I would be safe, it, it would be not a smart thing to do, and I don't think the president would like it too much. So um, Iran is a very complicated place. We think of Iran as sort of a monolith because they have a supreme leader. And when you hear somebody's got a supreme leader, you figure he just decides everything. But they actually have politics. They have a modulus, a legislature that uh, can and has impeached ministers. Uh, they have a modulus that although a lot of the candidates in the slates are hand-picked by the Guardian Council and by the clerics, still has a modicum of citizen involvement and electoral possibility. Um, they have the Islamic uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps uh, and the Quds Force and the Intelligence Service, which runs sort of on its own steam, its own budget. They use the black market a lot for their budget. When we finished the deal, we said they would undoubtedly get a small bump up. Uh, all of these numbers that are thrown around $150 billion, none of it is true. Uh, Iran had about $100 billion in foreign bank accounts that were their money, frozen assets because of our sanctions. Uh, our Treasury officials thought of that $100 billion, only $50 billion was liquid, the other was either junk loans or loans they owe to China, so not liquid. They thought they'd keep most of that $50 billion in those foreign accounts for currency for commerce. Um, but there was no doubt that the dark forces of Iran, or the dark, dark forces of Iran, uh, were going to get some bump up. It does not take much to do terror. It doesn't take much money to do terror. And Iran is the largest state sponsor of terrorism. And they do fund Hezbollah and Hamas. Uh, and they are now funding and supplying the Houthis in Yemen. Though the Houthis began their efforts in Yemen all on their own, Iran was in there pretty quickly. Uh, Iran is in Syria. Um, so they say they just want regional stability. Uh, those in the Gulf believe they want regional hegemony. Uh, there is no doubt this is in part a battle bes between Sunni and Shia um, uh, Islam. Um, very complicated uh, and hard for everyone to deal with because Iran is such a, uh, a paradox. Uh, Iran is um, 50, over 50% 50 of their population is under the age of at least 35, if not 30. They are almost 100% literate. Uh, they have a large consumer slash middle class. 
uh, women do drive um, and do uh, are professors. They are an Islamic society. Funny story in the book, I couldn't shake hands with my uh, colleagues, uh, so to speak. Uh, we had a very interesting discussion in part to find gom common ground. As I explained to them, I grew up uh, in a Jewish community and among the Orthodox, you can't shake hands. They found it a very odd conversation to be having since they think Israel should be wiped off the face of the earth and are deniers of the Holocaust, but it helped us sort of get past a very strange, awkward situation. So I think that um, uh, none of us who dealt with Iran dealt on the basis of trust ever. I don't trust Iran. Iran doesn't trust me. We tried to negotiate on the basis of some respect, that they had interests, they weren't our interests, we thought their interests were malign. Uh, this wasn't, in essence, a negotiation of equals. There was the permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany and the EU on one side and Iran on the other side, and we were there about their behavior. Iran, however, has deep distrust of us because even though most of us think about 1979 when they held 52 hostages for 444 days as the Iranian Revolution happened, they remember 1953, when the United States and Great Britain's intelligence communities worried that the duly elected Prime Minister Mossadegh uh, threatened to nationalize the oil industry, which would be bad for Shell Oil, um, knocked off the Prime Minister and put the Shah in his place. And the Shah, who may have watched out for American oil interests and British oil interests, was an oppressor, very harsh, very brutal. And that led to the Iranian revolution. So there is deep distrust for historical reasons on both sides of this equation. So speaking about distrust and mutual distrust, let's go to North Korea. Mm. Uh, uh, something that... Um, the cult. The cult. Uh, so in your chapter here, and, I, and everyone, I, I really do urge you to, to read the book. It's, it's fascinating. Um, you have a chapter called Letting Go. And you talk about North Korea, and you talk about your work uh, on North Korea and the Clinton administration in the late 1990s, 2000s, which I had the honor and privilege to work with you on. And you talked about it as the hardest failure to accept. So could you explain that for us? Yeah, I want to take one quick step backwards because it's um, emblematic of what I try to do in the book. The book goes back and forth between sort of personal things in my life that gave me the skills to do this. My husband thinks the book should have been called What's a Nice Jewish Girl Doing Sitting Opposite Iranians Negotiating Nuclear Weapons? <laughs> <laughs> and, a so and a social worker to boot. How, how the hell did you get here? So I try to explain how we use things in our life, you know, get a skill set and use it in our lives, take the experiences of our lives and for me, the chapter on letting go begins with the hardest personal thing in my life, uh, which when my brother was 25 years old and I'm seven years older than he is, so I was 32, he took his life. Uh, and uh, I have a family that has confronted depression. My father's father and my father's sister also committed suicide. And it was a very, very hard thing. I was a social worker. I should have been able to see all the signs. I should have been able to help out. But I had to come to terms with the fact that sometimes there are just things in life, even for a controlling type A person like myself, you cannot control. And it's true for all of us in our lives. Everybody has tragedies and losses, and mine has been a privileged life more than most. So the North Korea situation uh, was very hard to let go of because led by Bill Perry, whom I know many of you know well, who taught me a lot about how to build a team and how to develop a negotiation process. Just an extraordinary, extraordinary teacher. I was privileged, as was Phil, to be part of his team when um, President Clinton asked him to try to take a look because North Korea had flown a missile over Japan, and we were really worried. They didn't have nuclear weapons at the time. The agreed framework, which Bob Gallucci had negotiated, although had some issues, had held them from getting a nuclear weapon. 
But now we were worried they were trying to build a missile that would be able to carry a nuclear weapon and we needed to shut down that delivery system. So uh, we went to Pyongyang with Bill. We brought a letter from President Clinton. It took 10 months before North Korea responded and said they were going to send to the United States an envoy, Cho myung ruk the second in command of the National Defense Forces. And what year was that? That year was 2000, in October. Presidential election. Presidential election year. You might have remembered Gore v. Bush. So um, it was October, late October, mid-October. Mid and uh, Cho came, and he brought with him a rather detailed proposal to stop their testing of missiles. We'd already gotten a short-term moratorium put in place through our negotiations, but we wanted a permanent moratorium. And uh, Kang sak -ju was my counterpart, and we sat down with the team, and then Bob Einhorn, who was our, our missile expert, and we thought, gosh, there was something here to work with. Uh, we had ongoing discussions. Uh, Cho brought a letter from Kim Il-sung, the uh, father of Kim Jong, I'm sorry, Kim Jong, Kim Jong Il. Il. Yeah. Kim Il Sung was his, the grandfather. grandfather. Kim Jong Il, the father of Kim Jong Un, uh, that said uh, the president had an invitation to come the next week. <laughs> and we said, well, President of the United States, at least that president of the United States, wasn't going to come the next week. And he said, well, okay, why doesn't the secretary come the next week? And we said, well, it's sort of hard for the secretary to come next week. But indeed, Madeleine Albright went in 10 days, which is extraordinary. We have no mission, no intersection, no diplomats, nothing in North Korea. So we had to bring everything overland from South Korea, which was in itself a breakthrough that they let us drive overland into North Korea. We even brought Marine guards into North Korea, um, which was sort of crazy. All of our communications equipment, everything. And we, we were really amazed because Kim Jong-il actually knew the details of this missile agreement. And you know that you might make progress when the leaders know the details. Might give you a clue. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we had 14 critical issues and he ran down that list. He had answers to many of them. Uh, we continued discussions. We thought we were making progress. Uh, but we had a couple issues. President Clinton was trying to get Middle East peace. Arafat had promised him he was going to get it. Arafat, in the end, couldn't do it. Um, but So the president, up to the last minute, was trying to get Middle East peace, working at it night and day. And we thought we had to brief the incoming administration about what the North Korean negotiations were like, because we wanted continuity. Except there was this problem. The election wouldn't get over. Um, it didn't get over till December 8th. Uh, and so I went with Madeline on her last trip as Secretary of State. We went to Africa. I carried two suitcases with me, one with clothes for Africa and one with clothes for Pyongyang, waiting to see if the president would send me to Pyongyang to see if I couldn't negotiate the final bits of this and would have in my pocket a date that the president of the United States would come to North Korea. I never went. The election didn't get over, and finally at Christmas, uh, we made a final decision that it was too late and it wasn't appropriate to do. I then went to Colin Powell's house in Northern Virginia with some of my team to brief Colin and brief Condi Rice about the hand we were leaving them to play. Colin Powell said, this is a hand I think we should play. And he has said this publicly now. Condi Rice said, I think that President Bush will want to do a policy review. Most presidents who come in do do a policy review, to be fair, but this president decided he wanted to take another direction. In March, Kim Dae-jung, the president of South Korea, who very much wanted us to proceed forward, came. President Bush sent Colin Powell out from the meeting to tell the press the sunshine policy was over and the president was headed in a different direction. This was after Colin Powell publicly said that he was going to support the deal, this, the deal and right. the sunshine policy, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. he had publicly said this was a good thing. 
So this was really tough because I think it wasn't that there were problems. It turns out that North Korea had started a very nascent uranium enrichment program secretly. They, you know, you don't deal with good people who you can trust. You deal with people who are doing bad things. And just like with the Soviets, when we had arms control agreements and they cheated, we tried to get back on track, not blow the whole thing up. So, um, but the Bush administration went in another direction. Uh, the North Koreans did create problems and they built nuclear weapons. During the Clinton administration, not one additional ounce of fissile material was ever created. No nuclear weapons, no long range ballistic missiles. All right, so let us, let's talk about your reaction to Donald Trump's style with diplomacy in North Korea, because North Korea has very much been in the news the last year and a half. You and I have been quite busy as a result of that. We go from fire and fury to I love the guy, right? Um, is this approach Can you imagine what would have happened if I'd said I love the guy? Oh my God. Um, is this approach making sense? And what you know about what North Korea wants and what their motivations are? Maybe you can little, just briefly talk about that. What's your reaction to all of this? Are we going to get a deal? So I supported the Singapore summit. Yeah. And I supported the Singapore summit because these are both guys who believe they're the only ones who matter. Kim Jong-un is the only one who matters because if he doesn't like you, he kills you. He killed his uncle and his uncle's family two weeks into taking the leadership of North Korea because he thought the uncle was challenging his control. The President of the United States is the only one who was elected president, that is true, but we do have a democracy with some checks and balances, so in the end he really isn't the only one who matters, but he does think he is, and so I thought they might break through, maybe these two guys would break through, but I said the President had to go prepared with a detailed plan, with a team ready to go, with follow-on negotiations, with clear consultations, particularly with South Korea and Japan, with China as well, probably Russia also. In other words, go in with a full-blown idea of where we were headed and what we were going to do and who the heck was going to do it. It didn't seem to work out that way. <laughs> the piece of paper that came out of that summit was the thinnest document out of any summit with the North Koreans, including ones the South Koreans and the Japanese have had didn't mention denuclearization, really extraordinary. Um, so I was very concerned. Uh, I was glad when Secretary Pompeo took up the baton. I thought it was a pretty hot baton to hold, but you know, I thought maybe he'd do something with it. He's a very smart man. Uh, he has put a team together. Uh, Steve Began, who uh, was head of government affairs for the Ford Motor Company for like 25 years, very, had been at the State Department, had been at the National Security Council, uh, been on the Hill on the, on the Foreign Relations Committee. I know Steve very well, very capable, very professional, very smart, didn't know North Korea, but is a quick learner. Uh, knew that he would really go at this in the kind of way you need to go at it. So we will see, but there are a few things happening that are of concern. There's hum huge divergence between what the U.S. appears to be trying to do and what South Korea wants to do. South Korea wants to reestablish economic ties, set up a liaison office in North Korea, uh, reconnect the railroad, uh, really begin acting as if they're going to reunify the two Koreas, which certainly the Korean people want. Um, meanwhile, we want to keep sanctions on, maximum pressure. Um, the Japanese are nervous about what we're doing altogether. Uh, they don't want to be left out of this equation. The Chinese, which provide almost 90% of what North Korea has in terms of its economy, you know, see the president come out of the summit and say the threat is over. I love the guy and figure they don't really have to completely enforce sanctions anymore. So the pressure really isn't on in a maximum kind of way. And then the last thing I'll say about this, which I have said um, aloud before, is whether I negotiated in the Middle East or with North Korea or Cuba or um, Iran or anybody else, there was a policy process. I knew what the President of the United States was asking me to do. I knew what authority I had. I knew what the right and left margins were of the negotiation. I knew the rug would not be pulled out from under me. Steve Began, Secretary Pompeo, 
Not so much. Not so much. Right. Not so much. That's, that's the difficulty. All right, we're going to switch direction a little bit because this book is just not about foreign policy, um, although that's the frame in which you talk about other stories. It's really, you know, what was, what's great about it is about you, your career, diplomacy, <coughs> and personal leadership. And you talked a little bit about the nature of power. So I want to go back to the early, some earlier years for you because I think it would be interesting to the audience here. And I have two words that I, uh, well, actually three words that I want you to react to. Um, <laughs> One is courage, because that's a prominent chapter in the book, and the other one is social work, um, both of which you have stated, uh, I've heard you in, on different occasions, see as the foundation for your remark, what I think is your remarkable journey in public service. So talk about courage first, and then I would like to set up the, the social work piece of it. Sure. I think any of these, more questions for you. Oh, thank you. I think any of these negotiations we talked about took courage on behalf of the leaders that initiated them. Uh, when President Obama did his first inaugural address, he literally said, uh, we will reach out a hand, Iran, if you will unclench your fist. That was groundbreaking, and that was courageous. And he paid a price for it, because real courage always comes with a price. And I learned this lesson as a young person, uh, and it really began in 1963 when my father went to a Rosh Hashanah sermon. My father was in residential real estate. And uh, the rabbi, Morris Lieberman, in Baltimore, which is where I'm from, uh, had just been arrested uh, two weeks earlier trying to integrate an amusement park outside of Baltimore. And he thought he owed his congregation an explanation about why he let himself be arrested. And he said that he had been a chaplain uh, in uh, the army and had been at Dachau at the time of liberation. And it made him wonder what the ministers and the priests had um, said to their flock on Easter and at Christmas as Jews were being rounded up. And he thought that his comparable responsibility in the 50s and 60s in Baltimore was the discrimination and degradation of the African Americans in Baltimore. And he challenged the community to that cause. And my father was very, very moved by the sermon, and he went to see the rabbi and asked him what he could do, and the rabbi said, you're more powerful than I am, than any minister, or priest, or rabbi. You sell houses, so just advertise it as open housing that you will sell to anyone. There were no uh, open housing laws at that time. And my father said, if I do that, I'll be run out of town. And the rabbi said, well, you asked me what you could do. This is what you can do as rabbis are wont to do, <laughs> and ministers. So my father went home and he talked with my mother, and they decided to do it. In s within six months, 60% of my father's listings were gone. He added things to his business. He became incredibly well-known. Frank Cashin, who was the owner of the Baltimore Orioles, called him and said, Frank Robinson is coming to the Baltimore Orioles. I need you to find a place to live. Robinson wanted to live in an integrated neighborhood. He wanted good schools and he, for his kids, and he wanted a safe neighborhood. And um, the only thing my father could find him quickly uh, was in Ashburton, which was a more affluent African-American neighborhood. The next year, um, the Orioles won the pennant. Robinson was named the most valuable player, and he promptly told Frank Cashin, unless he could get a house where he wanted a house, he would not come back to the Orioles. So Frank Cashin called and screamed at my father <laughs> to find a house, and he did, um, including uh, offering uh, signed bats and baseballs. Um, but the person who rented the house increased the rent from 300 to $500 a month. Nonetheless, by 1968, my father's business was closed. My parents never questioned their choice. 
They taught me that doing the right thing is worth the price. My parents were then asked by Jim Rouse, who founded the city Columbia, which was meant to be an integrated community, if my mother would come on to help run one of the, Colum the community associations and if my father would be the head of sales and marketing for Columbia because he knew of my father's commitment to creating integrated communities. So this had a fairly happy ending after a very difficult time, but that sense of what it takes and why the last chapter, which is about persistence, I'm willing at my age not to start leaning out, <laughs> which some days I want to do, <laughs> heaven only knows, uh, to persist because I believe our country is at stake and you have to stay in it. Okay, let's then social work. I don't think many people realize that um, you had no formal international rela relations training. None. Um, you have a master's in social work. That was your first sort of job. And yet you rose to become the first woman to become the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. And in, in the book, you write that your best guide was a core set of skills from your master's degree in social work. And as a result of that work, the work you did in community organizing. Yeah. So we s have some young people here and very quickly, yeah. you know, there's so much to cover here. I wish we had a little <laughs> more time, but um, uh, you know, talk about that and why you say that. It's very interesting for people, I yeah. think, to hear. I think, every, I, I, think I, I say to young people all of the time, I speak to a lot of uh, university classes, Get a core set of skills. It sort of doesn't matter what they are. Uh, and then apply them to whatever wonderful opportunities come your way. So as a community organizer, I learned how to look at a landscape, how to assess what was going on, see what all the different interests were. I learned how to form a group and how to create a group culture and a set of norms, how to sort of identify an objective and organize the different interests to get to that objective. And I learned a set of clinical skills, and I only half joke that those clinical skills are very helpful with dictators and members of Congress. <laughs> uh, and you know, as you know, Phil, uh, yourself, uh, come from a very different background as well. And in Washington, most people are lawyers, and none of them practice law. Right. So uh, in, in the traditional sense. So. Um, a core set of skills can take you a very long way. And again, I just say my caseload has changed. It went from being the director of child welfare in the state of Maryland to I had the opportunity to run uh, Barbara Mikulski's first successful campaign for the US Senate. So I went to the state of Maryland politically. Uh, then I ran presidential campaigns and worked in them, went to the country. Uh, and then because of a phone call, I got out of the blue uh, to meet Warren Christopher and became Assistant Secretary of Legislative Affairs and then went on to be Madeline's counselor, then built a global consulting business and then went back as undersecretary. The world became my caseload. I'm right. very lucky. Yeah, and I don't know if you realize it, but I met the first time I met you, although you didn't know me at that time, was when you were the Assistant Secretary for Legislative Affairs wow. and um, did a, a wonderful job there. How, okay. So we alluded to the conversation. We're going to switch gears again. We're, we're, I'm conscious of the time. We alluded to the beginning of our conversation, um, but uh, your book is very much a journey about you as a woman and in what continues to be. Because I am. Sir. Yes. Can't get away absolutely. from it. Yeah. <laughs> but, yes, she's putting me in my place. Um, what was and it continues to be a field, you know, national security field that's dominated mostly by men. And you have been a role model for so many people, men and women alike, me. Thank you. Um, and I, I have to say that uh, the women in, in my office um, are so impressed with you. Uh, one of the things they talk about is they say, oh, Wendy is so cool. They talk about her being a badass, right? And they want to be just I like you. So. Right, right? <laughs> so I, I, it's impressive. It really is. Um, and I think one of the things that they talked about, the ones who, you know, some of them have skimmed it, some of them have read it, they, they, wanna, they, they will read it more. They talk about what impressed them so much was that you talked about your personal experiences and the emotional side of your work. 
So can you describe your experiences um, as one of the only women at the table on negotiation? Because I remember seeing you in this, you know, in late night in Pyongyang, and you're surrounded by, you know, 10 of us, and you're the only woman in the room, right? Um, just give us a sense sure. of the challenges and, and how you dealt with them. Sure. Um, lots of different pieces here. Um, Madeleine Albright, I've been very lucky to work with some phenomenal women, obviously Madeleine Albright being one of them. And she taught me from when she was the UN ambassador that when you sit at a negotiating table, you are less Wendy Sherman, a woman, in my case, an American Jew. You are the United States of America. It's a pretty powerful thing. And if you remember that and use the power of that role and the power of that position, you can get a lot done. And I think that's true for all of us, whether you're a mother uh, or you are a father or you are a boss or you are a worker or a negotiator, whatever. Uh, there's power that comes with that role, and owning it and being it is critical. A another person whom one of my best friends, Barbara Mikulski, you know, four feet 11 inches tall, as we say, comfortably round. Uh, when she ran for the U.S. Senate, people said she didn't look like a senator, and she said, this is what a senator looks like. <laughs> and if togas didn't come in a size 14 petite, she's a little smaller then, um, if togas didn't come in a 14 petite, she'd make one, you know? She just inhabited the role. She made the role her, authentically her. And one of the reasons that I combine both personal and professional is because I think too often we treat them as two different things. We are our integrated selves. Everything we do every day, we bring all of it to that. You may go home and think you're a dad to, to Perry and Phoenix, but you've had all of the experience of your day, and that sometimes can make you an edgy father. Yes, often. <laughs> right? <laughs> and sometimes that can make you a, oh my God, I'm so glad I'm home. I'm tired of the day. I'm, it's a relief to be with my kids. But it's, you, you bring it all together, and we tend to think of work-life balance it's really work-life integration. We are our full and whole selves. So I try to convey that in the book. Um, it's hard sometimes to be the only woman in the room, and one of the smartest things I ever did when I became Madeline's counselor, uh, it's not a line job. Your only authority is your relationship to the Secretary of, the sta of State. And so I knew, being a woman, I needed a little more than that. So I asked... Uh, to be confirmed by the U.S. Senate with the title of ambassador. Yeah. It was one of the smartest things I ever did because when I went to those delegation meetings, the trilaterals with the Japanese and the South Koreans and the United States and was the only woman in the room, they all had to call me Ambassador Sherman and it made them think about me differently, immediately. Uh, so those things matter and none of us should be afraid to ask for them if it's necessary to try to use the power at your disposal. A couple of other points about all of this. Um, I have been able to do what I've done because I've had a phenomenal partner to do it. I've been blessed to uh, be married to Bruce now for almost 39 years. He was a journalist for most of that time. He now does polling for Pew. Uh, and he had a lot of flexibility and in his time. So he sometimes was the person who took our daughter to the emergency room, and that broke my heart. Uh, but it also broke his heart when he wasn't there. Uh, and um, it made me overcompensate sometimes, and I tried to learn not to overcompensate. The Sunday before Mikulski's primary in the Senate race, she was running against a sitting governor and an incredibly popular congressman from the richest county in the state. Uh, so the Sunday before, my daughter turned three. I felt very guilty for having been running this campaign. So I um, invited 16 three-year-olds <laughs> and a clown. No one should have 16 three-year-olds in their house <laughs> with a clown. <laughs> 
but it, I mean, I remember it so vividly, and um, she didn't remember it at all, of course. So, <laughs> but it taught me an important lesson to try not to overcompensate, and a really terrific therapist once said to me, no one died of a little guilt, just keep going. <laughs> So yeah, just really quickly here, we're yeah, we're all individuals. Not everyone is alike, but I think um, you know, the people ask me to ask you this question, um, and it's in here as well. Do you believe that women, generally, not stereotypically, but generally, have a different orientation or approach to problem solving? I am a, a believer in Carol Gilligan's book, A Different Voice. I do think that, um, and some of it is quite visceral, I do think women tend to think of themselves in relationship to other people, and I think men, at least in our society, are brought up to think of standing supported by other people, being the leader supported by others. Uh, and uh, not you don't have to go find out who it was, but someone wrote uh, for your introductory comments, um, you know, a great female leader. No one ever would write a line that said a great male leader. Right. Ever. So it's just we think about things differently. Uh, and what I think is most important is that we bring all of that to the table. The Iran negotiation was very odd. The high representative of the European Union was first Kathy Ashton and then Federica Mogherini. Their deputy is a phenomenal German diplomat who works for the European Union, Helga Schmidt, the greatest unsung hero of the Iran negotiations, spent more time with the Iranians than anybody. And then there was me. And Helga and I probably spent more time with the Iranians than anybody. Um, we were working through the details of the agreement overnight uh, just to make sure everything we thought was agreed was in the agreement before we announced it to the world. And the ministers had gone uh, with some of their aides to dinner. And uh, somebody started texting back to us that some of the ministers, men, were saying, um, I don't know, it's taking them so long. <laughs> if we've been doing this, it would be over by now. Why is it taking so long? And Helga and I just ignored the misogyny and got the work done. I, I do think we are trained, <laughs> uh, socialized, to focus on getting the job done not getting the next job. You all are focused on getting the next job more than doing the job sometimes. And, and I don't mean to... <laughs> Me? <laughs> Gosh, that got, that got a note of hell. Um, there's a Hewlett-Packard study that shows that if a man believes he has 60% of the qualifications for a job, he's qualified for the job. And it shows that women believe they have to have 100% of the qualifications to do the job before they'll apply for the job. I tell women everywhere, 60% is more than enough. You can learn the rest, or you can do what some guys do. Never learn the rest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great, great. So the final topic, <laughs> yeah. You all uh, have a great sense of humor. I'm no, glad we can all laugh at ourselves. Yeah, no, no comment great. on any of this right now. Um, Let's talk about leadership. Let's talk about Washington um, and the world. Um, a lot of the questions here center on where we are right now. And one of the things, one of the themes in your book is the importance of the diplomatic perspective in the world today. You talked about the need of persistence. Um, and the perspective is important to figure out the world and how to make it a better place. You talk about it being critical um, in all vocations business, politics, and you kind of contrast national leadership in the way you characterize it as very diplomatic, as autocratic versus diplomatic in a sense. Um, and a lot of the questions we have here are along those lines. Um, you know, under the Trump presidency, um, where do you think um, is the future of the American standing in the world? Now, um, we only have a couple more minutes here, so I want to, I want to, yeah, I want to. Small question. Yeah. Really, because uh, there's one question at the end that I think we I'll really do need to ask. Yeah. You talk about the Iran deal, because I think this is important, about being real. I mean, you talk about all the specifics, but it was really about higher principles and reimagining the world. I think all this is sort of connected. So 
have at it. Yeah. Um, you know, a, an autocrat deals with what is right in front of him without acknowledging history or imagining the future. It's very transactional. Sort of like building a building. <laughs> National security, the stakes are higher. It's about war and peace. And at the end of the Iran deal, it was just the ministers and the core Iran delegation sitting in a room. And Federico Mogherini asked everybody, every minister, to say a few words. Nobody else was in the room. The press was all gone. And everyone had eloquent things to say. And John Kerry was the last to speak because the United States of America came at the end of the alphabet. Uh, and he used the talking points we'd prepared. And then he dropped the paper to the table. And he said at 24, he had gone off. He had enlisted and gone off to Vietnam. And um, he'd gotten a Purple Heart. But he'd come back to protest the war because he thought it was wrong and that it was costing lives it should not have cost. And that for him, this deal was about no more war. And the room got very silent. Many of us had tears in our eyes. And then everybody, including the Iranians, applauded is incredibly moving moment because the stakes are incredibly high. It is not just about this moment. It is worrisome because I can imagine a narrative, someone uh, that we both know said this the other day and he was quite right. I can imagine a narrative where people say, well, I might not like the president's tactics, I might not like his language, I might not like his bullying, but he did get Canada and Mexico to cough something up. He did get NATO countries to chip in a few more dollars. He did take on China. The economy is doing well. Uh, but I don't consider that courage. And I consider the cost too great. And the events of this week around Jamal Khashoggi and saying that this is about uh, a big weapon sale to Saudi Arabia. First of all, there is no $150 billion weapon sale to Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia is very dependent on our weapons and our parts because all of their other weapons are American weapons. Uh, I think so far there's been $5 billion of sales to Saudi Arabia, and the Obama administration, I think, did $110 billion of sales to Saudi Arabia. So the facts aren't accurate. But more to the point, I have done work with Saudi Arabia. I have relations with Saudi Arabia. There are things I admire about Saudi Arabia. But to murder and dismember a journalist who spoke about his hopes for his country of origin in the way that Jamal Khashoggi did, I do not hold the president responsible for his death. But I do hold the president responsible for creating a, an environment that says the press is the enemy of the people, which was Stalin's line, to say that there is fake news when that's a fake concept, to create an environment of impunity to hold up autocrats around the world and say whatever they do in their country is fair game as long as it's not in my country, undermines what I think my father fought for in World War II, undermines what John Kerry fought for in the Vietnam War, undermines what friends of mine fought for in Iraq and Afghanistan and all of our NATO partners who invoked Article 5, the one and only time it's ever been invoked for us in Afghanistan after 9-11. It undermines all those values. Yep. So we've reached the point in our program for the last uh, question. And um, in your book, uh, and thank you, everyone, for your questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to, to a lot of them. They were, they were, we tried to mix them in as best we could. 
in your book, uh, and when I've heard you speak, you confer on what I can only call a blessing onto people, right? I love it. And I think for especially the young people here um, who have aspirations for what the world is going to be like, and some of them are very planned and focused, they're going to be looking to for advice. So I want you to tell everyone what is the blessing and why that specific wish. So I wish uh, for everyone, particularly young people, but for everybody, an unexpected life. Uh, mine has been that. I think for women in particular it often is because if we want children, uh, we have to go in and out of the workforce in different ways. I think that's more and more true for young men uh, than it was perhaps for my generation, though my husband was an outlier in that regard. Um, I'm very concerned that young people are afraid of risk, uh, that they want to know uh, exactly what their first job should be out of college. I had a young woman talk to me today about what she should do and should she do this or should she do that or should she do the other. And I said, well, when are you finished your program? She said, 2020. I said, oh, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> Stay in the present. Learn what you can. Stay in the present. And um, the best things have come to me, like that phone call uh, by a mutual friend saying, come and meet Warren Christopher. I had no idea why he wanted to meet me, which ended me up in a career in national security and foreign policy or a uh, professor who introduced me to Barbara Mikulski because she was looking for some policy ideas about how to uh, finance shelters for battered women and led me and her to become fast friends and then my deciding to go to Washington to be her chief of staff. Things I never would have imagined. So to answer my husband's question, no one would have imagined me sitting across from Iranians negotiating a nuclear deal. I wouldn't have imagined me doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been very lucky to have a very blessed and very unexpected life, and I wish it for all of you. So <laughs> our, uh, thank you. Our, thac our thanks, very deep thanks to Ambassador Wendy Sherman, former Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs for joining us this evening. Um, and Wendy, let me just say on behalf of all of us here, thank you for your leadership, thank you for your public service, and doing what you have done and will continue to do to make the world a better place for us and our children and our, their children. So um, a reminder to the audience that uh, Ambassador Sherman is here and will be signing copies of her book um, outside in just a minute. So please make sure you can pick up a copy and um, I'm Philip Young, and now the commi uh, this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, um, the place where you're in the know, is now adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.